This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, thank you uh, very much to uh, Ravi and Henry uh, for the invitation and uh, to Sue for uh, helping organize everything. Uh, my background is as a political philosopher, but, but what follows isn't very philosophical. So I just, uh, it's an attempt to try and think practically about the challenges that, that face us. <clears throat> and I want to take as the starting point um, something that was in uh, the remit that was sent around by Ravi, which was this, that uh, climate justice requires thinking about obligations to future generations not to impose on them you know, dangerous climatic changes, and yet doing so in a way that doesn't inflict injustice on the global poor now. So it's framed as, is there a challenge uh, between reconciling our obligations to future generations on the one hand and uh, our obligations to contemporaries on the other. And so my whole paper and talk is really about whether there is such a clash uh, and what does it mean to say there's a clash and how can we minimize there being a clash. And <clears throat> I want to say two things at the start. One is from the point of view of what political philosophers call ideal theory. I think there is no deep clash between the two. So uh, there's different ways of making this claim. One is almost as a conceptual claim. You might think that principles of justice make claims about person's entitlements. They're entitled to receive, let's say, a decent minimum standard of living, or they're entitled to receive equal opportunities to flourish compared to other people. And then it seems to me to shortchange that notion if you then say, ah, oh, but something else clashes with it such that you may not be able to realize that. So what I argue is that principles of justice have to be fully costed, where you make a set of claims about people's entitlements to equal shares or to a sufficient standard of living, so entitlements claims, but then claims about duties and responsibilities. And they have to be fully costed in, they have to match up. And it's a hollow mockery to say to people, well, look, you're entitled to X, Y, and Z, but we don't have an account of the responsibilities that would uh, issue in that, um, or, or offering people claims about what they're entitled to, which exceed what anyone else is required to do. So if you take this picture one kind of point of view seriously, then it's false advertising if someone comes up to you and says, well, look, people have these rights to X, Y, and Z, and others uh, are not required under any description of justice to supply that. Um, someone is inflating what they're offering now. Now, I'm not going to kind of argue more for that. I just find that intuitively very uh, compelling picture. But I want to offer you a second one, which says, but look at the world we're in. Um, surely there is a clash between, on the one hand, honoring our obligations to future generations by not preventing climate change, uh, amongst other things, and meeting the needs of the poor today. And someone might reason as such, and so this comes from the Fifth Assessment Report. Uh, if you follow their references, you'll find similar, um, you'll find they're drawing on people like Miles Allen, David Frame, Malta Meinshausen, a um, series of articles in Nature in 2009. And the chain of reasoning goes as follows. Well, uh, humanity could emit a trillion tons of carbon. If humanity you know, wants to have a 50% chance of avoiding a two degree increase in temperatures over pre-industrial times. And we've used up uh, a half of that quota already. What's more, um, you might think that's too uh, generous a, a budget to be working with. So you might think that um, However we define dangerous climate change, the two degree target is too high. Uh, I mean, you might think that global mean averages aren't the best way to define dangerousness either, but let's leave that for one side. So the Paris Agreement um, you know, calls for lower than that. And I guess you know, many other people would too. It works with a, a probability of 
50%. So you may think that's just way too high a gamble. And it explicitly sets aside other kinds of forcing, like other greenhouse gases and um, the release of greenhouse gases from permafrost and methane hydrates. So this half a trillion that we have left will be shrunk dramatically if you go for a lower target, if you want better protection against dangerous climate change, and if you factor in other greenhouse gases. And yet, um, we have 1.2 billion people who lack access to electricity. So the person who says, look, uh, we have this, this clash here, we have to make trade-offs, can point to these two facts and say, are we not going to, um, are we going to ignore that second consideration about the impairment, imperative to develop, or uh, are we going to exceed that greenhouse gas budget? So I think both those statements I gave earlier are true, though. I think both, uh, in principle, there is no conflict, and in practice, there, there are trade-offs. And the reason is just that the first claim that says there is no deep clash is true under, under full compliance. So choose whatever date you think it is appropriate for humanity to have started taking action. Maybe 1990 or uh, you know, some date around that period. And assume then that the parties had complied with their responsibilities to mitigate and fund adaptation then. Um, you might think it's possible both to secure justice for future generations and also not compromise justice for contemporaries. Um, but how am I going to use these concepts? So I'm going to give you a, what I call a minimal and a maximal version, where the minimal one is supposed to be uh, as inclusive a criterion as possible without watering it down to meaninglessness. So someone might say, look, in a minimal spirit, the very least uh, we should have for current generations is, is that no one falls beneath a certain decent standard of living. And the maximal one is what I really believe, but you know, may recognize uh, uh, lots of other people don't and will be hard to ever secure, which is you might think people should have equal opportunities to flourish. So when I'm talking about justice for current generations, you can think of it in these two senses or supplant your own criteria. And then justice for future generations. Again, you can have a minimal approach, which just says, in the style of the Brundtland Commission, that no one should fall beneath a certain minimum standard of living, that people can meet their basic needs. But I think we should aim for something higher than that, and the more maximal one would be that we should leave future generations no worse off than the level to which we think current generations are entitled. I'm happy to unpack that notion a bit more in, under question, but I want to move on a bit. It's similar to Brian Barry's idea that we should leave the world um, no worse off than the one we inherited, but can leave it better off. But instead of his baseline, which is purely dis defined descriptively, uh, I give you a moralized baseline. But it basically says we, we can make the situation of our generation as well off as we want, as long as it's possible to leave future generations equally well off, um, but possibly better off. So, the claim then is, if we complied with our responsibilities, we could have uh, met these standards. But under partial compliance, because people haven't complied with their responsibilities um, to mitigate climate change and fund adaptation, um, we just can't assume now that it's possible to realize both of those standards. And that's why the second picture I gave there is very compelling. When you look at this very limited greenhouse gas budget on the one hand, and you look at the imperative that other people have to develop on the other, that's when there's this kind of uh, very pressing uh, tension between those two. Now, before I talk about what I think we should do about these trade-offs, uh, I just want to say something about why I'm even bothering to say that in ideal theory, these things are compatible. Because practically minded people might just um, think there's no point to saying that. Um, so I do think there's a point to saying that, and it's twofold. Uh, one is it's true. And if something is true, there's often a reason to at least think it and sometimes to say it. 
So I think one function of political philosophy is to tell us, as Jerry Cohen put it, what to think, uh, even when what we should think makes no practical difference. So even if now it's not possible to ensure that everyone can meet the standard of living to which they're entitled under perfect compliance, we ought to be aware of that, we ought to know that, because those people are being wronged and um, we should not live a lie. However, practically, it's also worth knowing this um, from the point of view of uh, practical implications, namely that this would ground claims for compensation. So here, here's a, an analogy just to bring this out. I suppose that someone is driving a car and at T1 that they begin recklessly, recklessly, is that such a word? Uh, now before they started driving in, in such a risky fashion, um, all the cars in the vicinity were safe. But as soon as they drove in this um, risky fashion, um, they hit some ice, and then it turns out that whatever they do, they're going to damage someone else's car. They're either going to go straight ahead and damage one car, or swerve to the right and damage someone else's. So what do we say in this case? Well, I say, and because of the full compliance condition, um, that person had a responsibility at T1 not to act in ways that jeopardize people's rights. And that's true even at T2. There's something true at T2, which is although then it's now impossible to act in a way that doesn't compromise rights, because whatever they're going to do, they're going to hit someone's car. Um, we should not forget the fact that they had a right not to be put in that situation. And so we need to have an account of what someone's entitlements are under proper compliance. Um, we need it because this person wronged those people. And so what we shouldn't say at T2 is, well, it's no longer possible to avoid hitting a car because it's no longer possible and ought implies can. They don't have an obligation not to hit a car. Uh, that's just false. Um, they shouldn't have put themselves in that position. It's culpable inability. And it also grants compensation. And I think the an analogy here is with climate change, that if people had mitigated earlier on, then they could have acted in a way that would jointly uphold lots of rights. And we should bear that in mind, even if it's now the case that whatever they do will compromise human rights. You shouldn't somehow shrink the set of duties and rights available because it's become less and less possible. But I really now want to talk about the practical issues. And so, I'm going to switch from philosophical discussions about ideal theory and full compliance to, um, to trying to negotiate the trade-offs. So remember, the, the question is, uh, do our obligations of justice to future generations and our obligations to contemporaries uh, clash? And in a practical-minded spirit, and I'm somewhat nervous because this is not my area of expertise, I'm going to put forward four policy uh, proposals that I think would help reduce those, the tension between those two um, sets of obligations. I'm going to draw on empirical literature from economists and, and others, um, but think of this more as a philosophically informed amateur saying, why don't we do this? Okay, so policy one, and this arose for some work I did for Oxfam America, and they wanted to explore whether there are equity issues surrounding stranding fossil fuel assets. Uh, climate ethicists haven't worked very much, indeed at all, on, on this issue. So here's how I think we could reason about it. Um, a lot of fossil fuels have to stay in the ground, point one. Point two, there's actually good reason to try and focus policy proposals on the extraction end of things, as well as later on with um, things like carbon taxes or carbon trading. And one reason is given by uh, Collier and Venables, which is to do with leakage. You know, if you can plug it right early on and just keep the stuff in the ground, then that has an advantage uh, over initiatives where you might put in a, say, emissions trading scheme in, in one region and people might uh, try and evade it by uh, using another region. So it seems to me there's some reason then to, to focus on the extraction end. And then, yeah, can you let me know when I have about 10 minutes left? Or? Uh, excellent, okay. Um, so then how should we reason about this? Well, here's two guiding thoughts. So one guiding thought is one fundamental criterion is about efficiency. 
which is if we have this limited budget, then as with all budgets, we have a reason not to use it in a profligate way. And so, therefore, we'd be very interested to know uh, which fossil fuels have the greater global warming potential. Or more generally, um, which ones can we get the most benefit from using? You know, will it be uh, gas, let's say, or something that has a higher global warming potential? But that, that says nothing about equity and fairness. So then the second thought is that we should have a policy of stranding assets that respects principles of justice for current generations, which, as you recall, I said should be governed either by a principle of sufficiency or you know, more ambitious principle like equality. Um, and of course, we should bear in mind here that many fossil fuel rich countries are developing countries, like right? Angola, Nigeria. And there are others that, that you know, are much higher up, like um, Ecuador, but are heavily reliant on um, fossil fuels for export. So we can't just take an efficiency-only approach. Uh, we need to have a principle of equity. And then the thought is, well, why don't we have some proposal for, for stranding assets that's informed by the efficiency consideration, but which then either gives privileged rights to extract fossil fuels to those who, would, those who are in the most need, or alternatively, which uh, imposes you know, limits on using them, but compensates them for the non-use. So it's a sort of equity-sensitive compensation package. Now, uh, you know, some people have proposed something a little bit like this, but they've said we should compensate anyone who has high reserves of fossil fuels because they're being denied an opportunity um, they would otherwise have. That's not what I'm arguing. I think that's mistaken. Uh, I think the opportunity cost is, should only be factored in for those who are entitled to it according to some principle of justice, like sufficiency or quality. And so this kind of takes a leaf out of the idea underlying the Yasuni ITT uh, initiative, an idea which can then floundered because no one was willing to put up the resources. Uh, but it seems to me the principle is right, and it seems to me, and I'm puzzled why this isn't said more, so it might mean there's good reason it's not said, but it seems structurally similar to things like RED, where uh, payments are being made to one party to do things or not do things on the grounds that this will um, contribute to mitigation. And so with RED, it's you know, not chopping down trees and forests, and with this, it's not using fossil fuels, or not extracting them, I should say. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just thinking again, what, what would be reconciliatory strategies that could um, both protect future generations from climate change and yet not harm development? Uh, well, we could tackle fossil fuel subsidies. Um, you can see these figures from the uh, International Energy Agency reports from 2014 on the sum of money spent on fossil fuel subsidies and its comparison with renewables or energy efficiency initiatives. So, you know, isn't this kind of something we should be doing? Now, my first reaction when coming across this was to think, well, surely there was a uh, sort of distributive argument for such subsidies, especially consumer subsidies, that it's needed to protect um, poor members of the world so that they can afford to buy uh, energy or goods which produced in an energy-intensive way. But then the IEA says, well, no, actually, these things don't contribute much to those in the most um, need. Uh, you can see this quotation on the, um, the screen and then this further one that only 8% of the money spent on fossil fuel subsidies reaches the poorest 20%. And that other forms of welfare support um, you know, could perform the task more effectively. So then, you know, second reconciliatory strategy would be to say, well, uh, isn't, you know, eliminating or dr drastically reducing um, subsidies for fossil fuels a way of, of again, uh, protecting future generations but not undermining obligations to current generations? You know, assuming it's, it's um, accompanied with policies that do ensure that the world's least advantaged uh, are not denied access to energy. 
I mean, you can have two versions of this. One would be that we just eliminate such subsidies, and the other is we uh, use the funds that are currently uh, used in some of those subsidies for other uses like clean energy. So, reconciliatory policy three. Um, it, it seems to be hard to get away from the fact we need some kind of investment in, in clean energy technology and its diffusion. I mean, there are three considerations that jointly, I think, lead us to this conclusion. Um, one I began with earlier on, which is just, we have a small and shrinking greenhouse gas budget. Uh, two, uh, there's an imperative that people can develop. Um, Three, this is exacerbated because there's been a failure uh, to mitigate sufficiently by the advantaged to the extent that you know, it enables the least advantaged to develop. So uh, I can't see any conclusion that could follow from this other than we would need some kind of clean technology revolution to enable development but without triggering uh, dangerous climatic changes. And so various people make proposals then for... Uh, trying to realign uh, the rules concerning uh, intellectual property rights over technology in, in such a way as to induce people, uh, to incentivize people to produce clean technology in ways that don't have harmful effects and which can be used by all. So I've mentioned one there, the Ecological Impact Fund, but you can think of other variants, no doubt. Okay, and then... Um, Again, the quest is really just to try and minimize any uh, trade-offs we have to make. Uh, let's look at population growth. So um, most people now will accept that population change is a driver of environmental change. It's not just the level of consumption. It's not just the level of technology. It's the number of people. But the world's population has uh, quadrupled over the last uh, century. Um, and you can see these projections from uh, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs on future population changes. And then others argue, well, look, but if, if uh, population growth um, can slow or be reduced, this can contribute massively to mitigation. This is from uh, something in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now, of course, population growth um, and talking about it immediately raises moral concerns and, and political concerns about the kinds of policies that might be coming next. So here I just want to argue, well, look, but here are three kinds of policies which people should be doing anyway, which are needed to secure justice for contemporaries now in any case, that as it happens also have benign effects on the demographic drivers of, of climate change. So uh, rights to reproductive autonomy. I mean, you can see the figures up there from John Bongartz and Stephen Sinding on unwanted pregnancies. So if you think that women have a right to reproductive um, autonomy, then you will welcome this anyway as a matter of justice to contemporaries. And this has kind of beneficial effects on the climate problem. Second, well, human rights to education and to decent employment opportunities. Again, there's a sort of reconciliatory argument that realizing women's rights to these uh, you know, dampens population growth because it increases uh, women's economic opportunities. Um, and so they may prefer to go into employment rather than um, have children. Again, I don't think there's anything particularly morally troubling about it. This seems to be what justice requires. And then uh, the third kind of demographic type argument would be about the right to an adequate standard of living. It seems to me there is sort of strong empirical evidence to suggest that um, if you increase people's standard of living, then you reduce demands for having children, at least children as a form of uh, social insurance and children as a, as a source of income through uh, labor while uh, people are children. So um, realizing these rights then also contributes to reducing population growth, which um, has a beneficial effect on the climate. So you now see what I meant when I said 
I'm trying to just put forward um, as food for thought four reconciliatory strategies that ease any tension we might have then between uh, justice for future generations on the one hand and justice for contemporaries. Posed abstractly, you might think there's a deep clash. Um, examined concretely, you know, maybe, uh, at least with some of these policies, uh, there's much closer harmony than you might fear. Okay, so I now want to, I'm gonna wrap up now, so, right. Uh, I now want to sum up. So, remember that the framing question, which was, is there a deep clash or contradiction between justice for future generations and justice for contemporaries? My claim one was, um, there is no such tension under conditions of full compliance. Or I could put it more modestly, there's less of a tension, the more compliance there is. Um, and I argued this is uh, both true and of practical significance. Um, it's a practical significance because um, it, it should affect the way we, we see the harms of climate change now and because it grounds claims for compensation. I'm not saying that these claims are going to be uh, met, but uh, it explains and justifies why some parties think there are rights to be compensated. Claim two was, um, although in principle there's no deep clash, in practice, because of non-compliance, there, may, may, there you know, may very well be a tension between realizing these two objectives. And therefore, rather than sort of do abstract philosophical theorizing um, about this, I thought the most sensible thing to do was to try and descend into the practicalities and therefore um, explore ways of jointly honoring both. And so in that spirit, I put forward these um, four suggestions. Now, I should say the claim is not that these are unique or these are the only ones, and the claim is not that these will uh, eradicate the problem or eliminate it. Uh, the claim is just much more modestly that we need to do things like this to reduce any tension there, are, there is between them. And if someone says, ah, oh, but there are other things we should do as well, then uh, I'm fully on board with that. But my claim is only, it seems to me, that we have very good reason to do each of these four things, um, but open to saying we ought to do much more. Uh, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.